so I'm sure you will agree that those are some pretty good looking engravings. And yeah, they certainly are. And it's also worth adding that I didn't do them, in part because they're perfect, and also because the square is well over 100 years old. Anyway, the reason why I bring it up is that I'm currently in the design phase for the next big project, and it occurred to me that one thing that I will need is a way to engrave graduation lines on several pieces of steel. Now for round stuff I'm fine because I can just use a sharp tool in the lathe and use it like a shaper, but for flat stuff I do need to use the mill. Now prior to this I have used several different types of cutters to try and engrave steel and the results were never particularly amazing, in part because the spindle RPM was just too low for the very sharp cutters that I was trying to use. Back when I used to run a CNC mill I used to use similar end mills and I'd be running them at about 12,000 and even though I currently have a high speed pulley setup, I don't think I'd be able to achieve even half of that. Thankfully though there are other methods and the one that I want to take a look at today is drag engraving. Essentially someone in the past had the great idea to take a piece of diamond, stick it in a spring loaded holder, push it into metal and use it to cut engravings. And from what I've seen they seem to work really well. Not that I've used one personally but the results looking on the internet are pretty much what I'm going for. And I was just going to buy one until I saw the price of them. And look, I'm not saying that a well-made one isn't justified, but looking at the ones online, I know I should be able to pull it off for about 10 or 15 bucks, and it shouldn't take very long to do either. Now the only real challenge here was to try and get that diamond tip cutter. Just looking online, the cutters themselves tend to be pretty expensive. That is at least if you buy them specifically for a drag engraver. Instead, what I'm going to use are these single point diamond tip dresses, which you can get on eBay for about 10 bucks. Technically they're made for dressing grinding wheels, which is the reason why I bought them last year, but I see no reason why I can't reuse them as engraving bits. They look almost identical, and the tip is made of diamond. I mean it will need a bit of modification, but for 10 bucks, let's see if it works. So first of all, let's just see if it actually cuts. There's no point doing all of this if the diamond simply pops out the first time that I cut with it, and let's just see if I can get away with holding it in an ER collet. So this is just a quick test in aluminium, and you know what? It's actually working quite well. The aluminium is a bit gummy and it's leaving quite a big burr, but hey, it's engraving, it's a very clean line, and the diamond hasn't popped out. Aluminium though is pretty easy, so let's try steel, which is what I'm going to be engraving when I actually need to use it. And once again, it's doing a real good job slicing through the steel and leaving a really clean mark. Although by the looks of things, I may need to tighten the collar just a little bit more. It looks like it's wobbling just a little bit when I change direction. Now you know, I was thinking of just leaving it like this, but trying to accurately set the tool pressure on a tool like this where there's no compression is a bit hard to do consistently. Now you could get around this by doing something very similar to what Project Farm does. But I think a simple spring-loaded tool is going to be the easier, quicker way to do this. So let's start off by modifying the tool shank. Like I said before, the tool shank is the wrong shape for what I want. As it is at the moment, the front is wider than the back, and what I really want is the opposite of that. And also as it turns out, that end bit wasn't even turned down correctly. It's tapered, which would explain why the collet couldn't properly grip it and it was moving about before. Anyway, to keep all this concentric, what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out the three-jaw chuck to the collet chuck. It's not going to be perfect, but it should give us at least 10 to 15 microns of runout, which is more than good enough for what we need here. So the first thing I'll do is I'll take the back shank down to about 9mm. You can probably see from the footage just how out of whack it was turned the first time round. And I'm not sure what sort of steel this is, it's some sort of mystery gummy alloy, but it'll be good enough for what we need here. And according to the micrometer, we're pretty much spot on. So we'll then get it flipped and then turn a step on the other side. And this needs to be as close to 8mm as I can possibly get it. The other end doesn't matter as much, but this side does matter. And also looking at the tip, it's almost concentric, but it's not perfect. It is a few microns out, so I may need to lock the spindle when I use it. And 
And once again, that is almost spot on, eight mil. All right, and that is the cutter now done. I'm sure you can kind of see what I'm going for. All it really needs now is a holder and a spring. Now the style of holder that you do can sort of go either way. You could complicate it and go for some sort of Morse taper, which I've done before, but that takes a lot of setup and it really isn't necessary here. So what I'll do here is something straight that you can simply chuck in a dual chuck, much easier to do and much quicker to set up. Now my dual chuck can go up to 16 mil, so I'll use 16 mil round bar to make the holder. It doesn't need to be too big, this one is just over 5 centimeters, which is more than enough room to give us a bit of movement, a spring and a screw to keep it all together. So the first thing I'll do is open up the back. The size here is not critical, so I'll just use a 9mm drill. The important thing though is that I'm not going to drill all the way through. Instead, I'll only be drilling about 40mm. And with the hole now drilled, I'll then tap the end for M10. This will be for the retaining screw. I'll then go ahead and flip it, and then I'll drill a hole just under 8mm. In this instance, 1964 of an inch. Now I was going to ream it to take it to 8mm exactly, but I can't find my 8mm ream at the moment, so what I'll do instead is simply use an 8mm end mill. It may not give us the same results as a reamer, but it does get pretty close. And looking at the fit, it looks to be pretty good so far. The final thing I need to do is make a screw to screw in the back to keep the spring in place and also to set the preload on the spring. So I'll get a piece of rod in the lathe and then take it down to 10mm. And before I cut the M10 threads on it, I'll first make a small gutter. Doing this should prevent the parting blade from moving around a little bit. And before parting it, I'll cut a slit in it so I can tighten it with a screwdriver. Alright, and those are the parts now done. I've also found two springs, which I'll double up, and hopefully that provides a bit more pressure. And that is pretty much how it all goes together. At this point, I really want to stress just how simple and quick to put together this design was, and if it works, there's really no reason to get one of the more expensive options. Speaking of which, let's see if it actually works. So what I'll do here is I'll dial in about 10 millimeters of compression on the DRO and then every time I release the tool and then compress it, I'll then go back to that same 10 millimeters of compression. Just so we have the same force going into the part and hopefully get very consistent lines. So what I'm going to do here for the test piece is I'm going to make a graduated scale. I have 5 millimeters of spacing between each one and every second one is longer. And this is very similar to what I'm going to be going for when I do the proper one on the big project. And looking at that, that has come out looking really good. Much better than the results I was getting before using a V-bit. What I'll do now is test the consistency of the line widths. And looking at all the lines, I think the lines look to be pretty consistent in their line width. All in all, I am really happy with how that's come out. So there you go, less than about 2 hours of work and I was able to save myself about 120 bucks. This was easily about one tenth the price for what they charge for a proper one. And I would argue that the results are pretty much the same. Now how long that diamond will last is anyone's guess, but even when it does break I have a ton of replacements which I should be able to make up 
in less than 15 minutes. So there you go. Expect to see this pop up soon. And with that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next time.